There's a man named Stephen Kozar has a I listened. Channel. I listened to his YouTube response to that, and I thought it was badly distorting the truth of the matter. What Stephen Kozar failed to, to talk about was what Bob Jones told Mike Bickle on that night, March 21st, when they had that meeting late into the evening. To Mike to confirm to him what he had promised to his dad about him taking care of his brother, Pat. Stephen Kozar didn't mention that. All he talked about was that it was a little bit less snow than, in fact, th they might have said it was, or there was a little bit less rain that, that was prophesied that actually came about. So in this recently released roundtable discussion, the topic of Mike Bickle and the Bob Jones prophecies and me, Stephen Kozar, came up. I decided I would make a response video specifically talking about those issues, and there will probably be more videos in the future because there's four hours of very interesting material here. But to get this one started, I'm going to play various clips to help give you some background information as to what's going on in this discussion, and then we'll go through the roundtable video point by point. Mike Bickle is probably my best friend in this world. I know this man to the depths of his soul. I can't think of more biblically orthodox, humble, Christ-exalting individual. Dr. Sam Storms is very respected in the evangelical world as a legitimate scholar and theologian, and up until recently, he has been one of the most fervent supporters and closest friends of Mike Bickle. In this series of now-deleted 15 videos on Remnant Radio, Sam Storms went on and on about his support of Mike Bickle and his belief in all of the prophecies that were made by Bob Jones. His comments in this roundtable discussion are very similar to the comments that he made on Remnant Radio and on other videos as well. When people listen to these stories, I know your response, folks, and it, it, it comes down basically either they are genuinely true or Mike Bickle is a pathological liar. And he's not a pathological liar. <laughs> I know this man deeply. Um, uh, who lives a incredibly simple lifestyle. We would look as if we are living the Benny Hill lifestyle compared to how Mike lives. I know you're human, believe it or not. You really are. <laughs> so when I hear people say they think Mike Bickle is a false teacher, it angers me. It really does. I had to make a decision long ago when I came here. Do I think Mike Bickle is a demonized liar? No, I'm, I'm serious, folks, because I only have two options. Either Satan has orchestrated this entire scenario and all these people have conspired behind the scenes to deceive massive numbers of folk for their own aggrandizement and their own, uh, you know, Mike has really prospered financially from this, but yeah, right. Um, <laughs> Why did you look at my shoes? You yeah, <laughs> I'm just glad you got a no, new pair. You look down. He wore the same pair of shoes for 15 years. Yeah, that's true. I had to decide. There are only two options. When you have these, these, these tangible, confirmed um, realities that you cannot, you cannot escape, there's only one of two explanations. Either Satan and you have conspired, or God really did it and is going to do it. And I made up my mind a long time ago, and I've had no reason to back down from that. Uh, I know the man personally. I understand why you're skeptical about some of the supernatural experiences that Mike says that he has had. The amazing thing is virtually every one of them, and I think probably every one of them, because I, I know the stories very, very much in detail, have been empirically verified. Here's Sam Storms in one of those Remnant Radio interviews explaining why he knows the Mike Bickle stories so well. I think it was at about 1996 or 97. Um, Mike and I sat down, I think we did it over three days, and I sat with my laptop, Mike paced the room, and told every one of these stories in Dictated detail. Stories. And I would follow up questions. I'd say, what did that mean? How did it happen? How was it confirmed? And that's how all of this documentation came to pass. And So Mike Bickle paced the room for three days, telling stories and trying to remember things as best as he could. Sam Storms wrote it all down, and that's considered documentation. That's just one man writing down the recollections of another man. That's not really documentation. Doing something like this is actual documentation. You're using the weather records to document what actually took place, and then you can compare those records with what you're claiming took place. I know the stories very, very much in detail have been empirically verified. 
and confirmed by in ways that could not have been manipulated by individuals. In that clip, you heard Sam Storm say that these stories from Mike Bickle have been empirically verified. That's the thing that caught my ear when he said almost the exact same thing on Remnant Radio in the year 2022. And yet Bob kept coming with these undeniable, inescapable, empirically verifiable confirmations of his prophetic words. So I made this video in March of the year 2023, and I was specifically dealing with that whole idea that all of these prophetic words were supposed to be empirically verifiable. This is that same video two minutes in as you would see it on YouTube. And I'm going to do the same thing with this video as I did with the original video. I'm going to talk about three errors and why I chose those three. It's simply because they're really prominent in the storytelling of the International House of Prayer and the relationship to Bob Jones. And I figured if these are empirically verifiable, it shouldn't be that hard to look up the weather-related conditions on those three dates and see if it matches up with the stories. I found out that stories and and the weather data aren't exactly the same. In some cases, they're quite a bit different. Remember, here's what Sam Storm said about the prophecies of Bob Jones. And yet Bob kept coming with these undeniable, inescapable, empirically verifiable confirmations of his prophetic words. Let's take a look at these words, empirical and verifiable. Empirical, based on observation or experience. Verifiable, capable of being proven as true or real. So keeping those words in mind and the meaning of those words in mind, I'm going to play for you now the beginning part of that video from March of 2023. I've been going over all of these videos and working on making my own response videos literally since last year, and I still don't have one finished. So for the purpose of this video, I'm just going to focus on these three things. Number one, when Bob Jones walked into the office of Mike Bickle on March 7th of 1983, it was supposed to be a really warm day and it was really weird because he was supposedly wearing a winter coat even though it was warm outside, when the actual weather records show that it was actually in the 40s on that day. Number two, March 21st was not a double winter. There was no snowstorm. There was no snow at all on that day. There was only a tiny dusting of snow the day before. And it never got warm enough for the snow to melt. So all of the prophetic stories that we hear about that day can't be true in the way that they describe them. Number three, Mike Bickle claims that Bob Jones predicted there was going to be a big, serious drought all summer long and that for one day out of the month, there was going to be a bunch of rain, and that was August 23rd of 1983, where it was supposedly a big rainstorm in the evening. But the weather records indicate that there was just a small rain shower at 8 o'clock in the morning. There was no big rainstorm, especially not later in the afternoon or evening. Okay, let's start with number one, and this is the easiest one to disprove. Everybody agrees, in fact, it's even in Mike Bickle's book from 1995 called Growing in the Prophetic, that it was on March 7th of 1983 that Bob Jones walked into his office on a really warm day wearing a winter coat. That's the story that's told over and over and over. So, in comes, it's March 7th, 1983, so it's about four months after we'd been at Kent City. In came this most unusual man walking into my office. And so it's nice and warm outside. Had been a couple weeks. This man walks in my office with a winter coat on. He comes walking in in a winter coat. Walking in as a total stranger. He's about 55 or 60 in overalls wearing a winter coat. It was about 70 degrees out. <laughs> the official weather report for that day, March 7th, 1983, high of 51, low of 34. It was about 70 degrees out. <laughs> When he originally prophesied. When he originally it. prophesied all this, and but it, it was, was hot outside. Yeah, it was. On March the 7th of 83, I went over to meet with him, Mike Bickle and some of them. The Lord had told me to wear a coat, a heavy one. It would be a sign uh, that, that there'd be a double winter that year. Okay, so now you have an idea of what my video was like. I want to go back to the roundtable discussion, and I want to show you how Dr. Michael Brown and Dr. Sam Storms bring up the now very uncomfortable topic of Mike Bickle back before the really disturbing information came out about Mike Bickle. And then we'll go through that part of the video chronologically. Yeah, so I'm, I'm talking to Todd Friel, right? And he says to me, Mike Bickle, false teacher, right? Uh, so I'm... Uh, do, do you all believe Mike Bickle's a false teacher? A statement from Sam Storms and Michael Brown. 
Both of us were caught completely off guard by the recent disclosure concerning Mike Pickles' sin. We had only known Mike to be a godly man who was leading an exemplary life. Our comments in the discussion affirming Mike were recorded six months before numerous allegations were made against him. We acknowledge that we were lied to and deceived by Mike and we grieve for the damage this does to the name of the Lord, the reproach it brings to the spirit, and the devastation experienced by his victims. To whatever extent Mike's sin undermines the integrity of the history of the Kansas City Prophets is yet to be determined. While we both continue to regard Mike Bickle as a friend, we are devastated by the depth of deception in his life. I believe that Mike Bickle has lied about a number of things. Um, in fact, not the least of which, he claims to have been to heaven at least twice. I don't believe that. I don't believe he's been well, to heaven. Well, you may not believe it, but how can you know he's lying? There's only two possibilities. Theologically, biblically, he has not been to heaven. See, I believe back. he has. Okay, I, See, I, I strongly all, Everything that you said about Benny Hinn without knowing the man personally, Mike Bickle is probably my best friend in this world. I've, I was in a small group with him and his wife for seven years on his staff as his senior associate, involved at IHOP for an additional four years, 11 years. I know this man to the depths of his soul. I can't think of more biblically orthodox, humble, Christ-exalting individual. So this is really an interesting point in time right now because he was very, very convinced that he knew Mike Bickle as good as any man could know another man and that he was a, a good guy. And now we find out that he was actually living a life of in incredible deceitfulness. Um, you know, uh, basically, he was fooling people. He was tricking people. He was leading a double life. So... I think a really good question to ask is if the very best of us can be tricked by somebody that we thought we knew. I mean, we really thought we knew. If it's possible for the very best of us, the brightest, the smartest, the people that you might think are the most discerning could still be tricked. What does that say about the need to not have people put on a pedestal because they're hearing directly from God and they are now prophets or apostles or leaders of movements that are started specifically by themselves because they are hearing from God. That's who Mike Bickle was. He was the guy hearing from God or he was hearing from God along with people like Bob Jones and Paul Kane. So all these people were hearing from God and they were considered of, uh, of the kind of uh, character that was not really to be questioned. Well, now we know that his character is greatly to be questioned. So we put all of the weight on their prophetic words and on their prophetic ideas and on the movement that they began. And now we realize that that was a very shaky foundation. Uh, who lives a incredibly simple lifestyle. We would look as if we are living the Benny Hill lifestyle compared to how Mike lives. Every penny of his honoraria and of his royalties goes to missions to support the missions base. Um, and this oh, is a little house. Oh, look, he lives in a duplex. Uh, yeah, he's lived in a duplex all his life. So if you live in a duplex, but you're having affairs with young women, kind of negates all of the so-called frugality that you claim to have. But this has been one of Mike Bickle's big um, reference points. I'm not like those prosperity guys, and maybe it's true, but... Do we actually know for sure how much money he took in or what he did with the money? Uh, from some of the claims, he was actually spending rather extravagantly on women, young women. So when I hear people say they think Mike Bickle is a false teacher, um, it angers me. It really does, because I know the individual. Um, we're not talking about just watching ministry. Uh, I know the man personally. So this is a really interesting point for all of us in any kind of ministry position, uh, whether you're a lay person or you're the guy on stage with a microphone. Here's a case of a really smart guy who was absolutely convinced of the character of his dear friend and was standing by all of the claims that that friend made, at least to some extent, maybe to a large extent, based on his character, his supposed character. Well, now we find out, find out that the character wasn't really there at all, that there was a double life. So what we only can do for sure is to check the claims. And that's what I try to do. The claims about weather can be checked. You look at the weather reports and you see if these things are so. And he's not NAR, as has been claimed by so many, and he's openly defied it. Actually, Mike Bickle is pretty close to the very dead center of the NAR, and I'll prove that in other videos. 
I mean, I was on I was one of the elders in his church. Nobody claimed to be an apostle. We would never have conceded that an apostle should rule and govern the church. That sort of thing was just simply never present. So again, I understand why you're skeptical about some of the supernatural experiences that Mike says that he has had. The amazing thing is virtually every one of them, and I think probably every one of them, because I, I know the stories very, very much in detail, have been empirically verified and confirmed by in ways that could not have been manipulated by individuals. Right. Sure, go ahead. May I address that? And, and this might take a couple of minutes, but I, I have the notes in front of me. So I, are you referring to the... Um, the, the uh... Just for full disclosure, Justin Peters was looking at some notes that I sent him the day before because he watched my video and there's a lot to take in. And he wasn't sure that he could repeat what was in that video without kind of stumbling for words. So I just typed up some of the... Uh, some of the facts in that video in the form of an outline. So that's what he's looking at. The, the uh, prophecy about the, uh, the first time that Mike Bickle met Bob Jones and the double winter and all that, is that kind of what you're, that story? Well, that's just part of the stories. I okay. Mean, yeah, that... So um, I, watched that, I watched that video, and um, there's a man named Stephen Kozar has a I listened, I listened to his YouTube response to that, and I thought it was badly distorting. The truth of the matter. But there, there's... So Sam Storm says that I was badly distorting the truth of the matter. And what I want to show is that there's nothing that I distorted. There's nothing that he can claim I badly distorted. The claims that he and Mike Bickle made about the weather are at best only partially true. At best. For instance, if you have a light rain shower in the morning... And the stories you tell claim to have a tremendous downpour that evening at 7 p.m. And every story is a little different. Sometimes it's 6 p.m., sometimes it's 7 p.m., sometimes it happens right before 7 and goes for a couple of hours. Sometimes it starts at 7, it stops, and then it comes back an hour or two later. But it's a downpour so heavy that you can't even walk through it. The, the rain was so intense you could not walk through it. <laughs> Which I don't know what kind of rain is so heavy you can't walk through it. I guess what he meant was... You know, it, you, you need an umbrella, and so if you didn't want to get wet, you would stay in your car. Um, so there was tremendous exaggeration in the uh, rain story. And there was, I would say, even more exaggeration in the so-called double winter, or the snowstorm story. First of all, it wasn't hot on the day that um, Bob Jones walked in to meet with, with uh, Mike Bickle for the very first time, when he was wearing a winter coat. You would be wearing a winter coat on a day when it's only about 50 degrees. So that was not exaggeration. It was just not true, not true at all. And the second part of that story, after he comes in on the first day uh, where he meets him on March 7th, then he predicts what's going to happen for the first day of spring, where there's going to be this sudden snowstorm. And then the snow is going to melt on the same day. So what we need to see on March 21st is a tremendous snowfall of some sort, at least a few inches, and then it needs to all of a sudden warm up so that it can begin to melt. Objective factual errors, I mean, when you look up weather records. I did. I know most people don't know what we're looking at. Okay, so. I went to the Kansas City Library, and I have got the newspaper articles, and I can I actually did research with the National Weather Service to confirm all of that. So. This is so bizarre because he claims to have watched my video and I show what he's claiming to have done research on. He claims that he went to the library and got the newspapers and he went to the National Weather Service and got the weather reports. Well, that's what I did. That's what I show in that very video that he claims is so inaccurate. So there's got to be some other newspaper in Kansas City that has a completely different set of weather records than the one that we all refer to. I think it's the uh, Kansas City Star. And I think there's only one National Weather Service here in the States, and the weather records that I use would have to be the same weather records that he claims to have used. So one of us isn't being accurate about telling the weather records. Now, I actually showed the weather records. He just talked about it, and uh, Dr. Michael Brown is smiling like, yeah, that's my guy, Sam Storms. He's got the real facts here. Well, I I'm showing you the facts. I don't claim to be as smart as these guys. I don't have a doctoral degree, but I know how to look up weather records. Here's part of my original video that Sam Storms claims is inaccurate. 
Here is the weather page from the Kansas City Times on March 8th of 1983, where they're telling you what the temperatures were the day before. And if we zoom in here, you can see that the temperatures that day were a little bit different than the government numbers. They probably have their own way of keeping track of the temperatures at the newspaper, but it's not even close to being in the 70s. Here you can see that I'm typing the city, the date, the year into the National Weather Service website. And it's really easy to do. You just Google the weather for Kansas City for the date you want, and you'll come up with a handful of websites, and you'll see the same data. Here's a really handy website called the Weather Underground, and you can see that it's possible to simply type in the date you're looking for, the year you're looking for, and you can see all of the weather data from that time and place. And as you can see, the temperature was at the warmest at about 1 in the morning, and it kept dropping throughout the day into the 40s. It actually got into the 30s by the evening. And those little places where it drops to zero is just a, a few hours in the day where they don't have data for that particular hour. But it was not even close to being in the 70s on March the 7th of 1983. When he originally prophesied When he originally it. prophesied all this, and but it, it was, was hot outside. Yeah, you know, the question has come up about the legitimacy of... Uh, of some of the experiences that Mike's claims to have had. And oftentimes goes back to his first encounter with Bob Jones. Now, Bob Jones was a very unusual individual, quirky, beyond words. Immoral, um, sexually immoral. Now, let's be clear about that. Okay. See, that, that's really slanderous. There was one incident in which Bob Jones manipulated two ladies. It's not slanderous to say that somebody is sexually immoral when they tell women to strip naked in their office so that God can give them a specific prophetic word. Now, he didn't have sex with them, if that's what you mean. So does that make it not quite as bad? Is it sort of okay-ish? Seems like he's implying that. I know he isn't, but the language here is... Well, it's the language that allows people like Mike Bickle to continually have a platform for decades. That's what it is. On the basis of what he con contended was a prophetic revelation, he never had sexual relations with them. So he admits that Bob Jones told these women because he believed God was telling him, ladies, take off your clothes. This is the man who also said a bunch of other things that started an entire movement. So why do we reject the ones about the women being naked, but we accept the ones about the great prayer movement? Which ones do we accept and which ones do we not accept? I think we don't accept any of them. That's my opinion. I think that we just reject people like this in their entirety, and we see if we can keep them away from having any kind of a teaching or um, any kind of an influence in the church. So if we love the people in our churches, we should be protecting them from people like Bob Jones. We shouldn't be protecting Bob Jones from the discernment ministers. Never. But did, didn't they... Was then removed from ministry for several years, submitted to counseling and discipline under the leadership of John Wimber in the Vineyard, and only after several years was he ever restored to ministry. And, just so we can be clear about this, Mike Bickle told him, you will never stand on my platform again. I'll never give you a microphone. Bob Jones had women come into his office and told them to strip naked so that he could prophesy properly over them because that's what God told him to do. And Sam downplays it as if that only happened once and it's not that bad. And after all, Mike Bickle told him he, he would never have the platform ever again because of that. Well, they're still talking about Bob Jones as a great prophet, as somebody that we all need to pay close attention to. Because it's the prophetic that strengthens our faith. The Lord is calling for a house of prayer and a house of intercession to come into being. that will be open 24 hours a day. To where the saints of God, whenever they get to call in, can go there and begin to pray. The praise will be there. You can go there and be ministered to. You can go there and join in the intercession. It'll be open night and day. It'll be the place that the saints of God will just literally go there and pour themselves out to the Lord like a love offering. And intercession and praise will be there 24 hours a day. Really, it began in 82, even before that. And I was in a church and I told the pastor, there's a group of young people that's coming that God is going to use in a big way. And their main calling will be praise and intercession. A friend of mine in Kansas City said, Bob, there's some young people you need to meet. They come from St. Louis. And he said, I think you're supposed to meet them. And I said, 
yeah, I am. <laughs> you know, I remember 36 years ago when Bob Jones first walked in my office with that strange winter coat, those overalls, and he told me all of these things. And I remember thinking, this man is so off. I mean, I had no way of understanding what he said. And on the uh, first day of spring when the snow is melting, then I'll tell you the secret of your heart and you believe me who I am. So Bob Jones was an incredible um, uh, hearer. He, he, was, he, he heard the Lord and then he just stepped to the plate and he didn't have to know who they were. He was not really a respecter of persons uh, from, from the great to the poor. Uh, he would just prophesy over them and speak truth to them. I was, I was just in awe of his ability to continue to do that. So which one is it? He's a guy who told women to strip naked in his office, but he's also a really good guy that we should love and respect. I have a wife, I have daughters. If they were told to strip naked in front of a man in his office, I wouldn't be saying nice things about him ever again. And I certainly wouldn't be referring to him as somebody that God used as a mighty tool to start a movement. So Mike was very clear about his stance with regard to that, at the same time recognizing that Bob had a remarkable gift. So Bob had a remarkable gift. This is uh, the Todd Bentley excuse-making program. Yeah, uh, Todd Bentley was sleeping with the intern. He was showing up drunk. He left his wife and children, but boy, he sure had a gift. Can you think of a better reason to not be a continuationist? Because I can't. I think this is the number one reason why trying to get new prophetic utterances from people who sort of maybe are prophets is inherently dangerous. It's inherently dangerous. There's no way to know for sure that something terrible won't happen. The way you do know for sure that something terrible won't happen is to not consider anybody a current modern day prophet. I mean, the Corinthians were as goofy and carnal as they can be, and yet they came behind no one in spiritual gifts. I, I just got to say, this is one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. The reason we, we have so much information or so much correction from the Apostle Paul to the Corinthians is because of how flawed they were and how immoral they were. They were actually guilty of misusing their spiritual gifts. That's why we have all of the information about the proper usage of the spiritual gifts. I've got a couple of quotes here from Mike Bickle's book, Growing in the Prophetic, where he teaches the same thing, that spiritual gifts are given as a free gift, just like salvation is a free gift to people who don't deserve it. So spiritual gifts are given to people who don't deserve it. The problem for us is that it is very hard to know what is really in someone's heart or how God perceives them. We need to be careful about judging spiritual gifts as invalid because of people's weakness and immaturity. God may be more concerned about what he has set out to accomplish in the life of the prophetic vessel than about passing full judgment on that person. Here's another quote from the next page. The fact that power and re revelation flow through prophetic ministers is not necessarily a sign that God is pleased with the other areas of their lives. Sometimes the prophetic gifts will continue to operate even when there is an inner crumbling taking place in their private lives. So, I do believe that the, the details of that particular story, here's the interesting thing. I know, I know we're kind of getting a little bit off base here. Um, what Stephen Kozar failed to, to talk about was what Bob Jones told Mike Bickle on that night, March 21st, when they had that meeting late into the evening. And what he told him was a promise that Mike had made to his dad 15 years earlier just before Mike's brother died, the very words that Mike spoke to his father that he never shared with another living soul. He never told Diane, his wife. He told no one. And Bob Jones repeated that to him. Now, I don't know. I guess there are only three explanations. Either a demon was behind that, and you can believe that if you want, or Mike and Bob conspired to, con to create this lie to promote themselves. Or thirdly, it was God. The Spirit of God revealed that to Bob Jones, and he spoke it to Mike to confirm to him what he had promised to his dad about him taking care of his brother, Pat. Stephen Kozar didn't mention that. 
So there's a couple of things I want to say about this point right here. I did put it in the video, but I just kind of skimmed across it and I just uh, put in parentheses. I tried to summarize it because I cannot, nor can anyone, verify if that's a true story using empirical evidence. So that's why I stuck with the weather stories, because you can verify or you can show that they're not true because you have weather records. So if somebody says on such and such a day, it's going to rain like crazy, you can go to the weather records and see if they were right or not. When somebody says, I had a secret that I told no one and Bob Jones revealed it to me, well, we just have to take his word. That's all we have. We, we have no way to verify that. Now, Sam Storm says that he can trust Mike Bickle because he knows him so well. Well, I don't know Mike Bickle that well. And to be honest, Sam Storms didn't know him that well either. So this whole um, idea that I should have brought uh, some attention to this part of the story, it really falls apart in a hurry. The second thing about this story that's really important is that when, um, basically, this is the story. Mike Bickle had a brother who was injured, uh, actually severely injured in a football uh, incident. I think he broke his neck. The original prophecy at IHOP, and this is on videotape, really grainy old videotape from, I believe, the 80s. The original prophecy was God was going to heal his brother and God was going to build this giant movement around the world when everybody sees that the brother was healed. The fear of God's come. The Lord has told me, I have come. What does it mean? Of course, I know Bob Jones's word and Augustine already told me. But Augustine told me, actually, right then, I even talked to Augustine even that minute on the phone. I mean, he's, he calls again that very second while Pat's on one line, Augustine's on the other. And, you know, the, they're yelling, Augustine's on the line, and he says, hurry up. He's not waiting no more. Like, well, Pat's away, you know, wait. Tell him to wait, you know. And so I got both of them on the line at the same time. And I hang up, and he tells me this whole detail about Pat. And so the Lord visits Pat in an open way and tells him, I will deliver you. In essence, that's what it comes down to. Before this whole city, God's going to deliver him. Now, uh, in Acts 3, it's interesting to note that in Acts 3, the key miracle that opened up the city of Jerusalem was a paralytic. And how many people came in after the paralytic? 5,000. 5,000. In Acts 14, the city of Lystra, one miracle opened up the entire city, a paralytic in Lystra, and the whole city responded to the Lord. Or, or not the whole city, but I mean, it caused an uproar in many converts. Not everybody accepted it. The Lord, in His foreknowledge, ordains miracles that open the doors to cities in the gospel. There's not very many times in history where God has opened a city through a miracle. But God has made Pat a sign to this city. 1973, he's in the front page of the newspaper five or six times, on the radio, on billboards, everywhere. Everybody knows Pat Bickle, a high school athlete, is paralyzed, and he claims, God will deliver me one day. And, and many of you remember the story. And so the, the, we go to St. Louis for seven years and come back, and this thing, though it's died in many people's heart, it's alive in Pat's heart, and it's alive in the heart of God. And the Lord says, 5,000 will come. And the Lord says, when I lift him up on that day and, and the waters burst forth, the Son of God will personally come and deliver him. So that prophetic word about God healing Pat Bickle obviously never came true. Now, I just found something in the process of finishing up this video that I want to play for you. It's just a quick 45-second soundbite. And I found it on the channel Hush Hush from these this uh, young couple that are former IHoppers, and they've done a lot of investigative work. And I think this is probably from a podcast somewhere, but I'm just going to play it for you. And it's basically the person who was in charge of transcribing these old tapes was told to change them in order to cover up false prophecies, like the one about Pat Bickle. Bob Jones prophesied that Mike Bickle's brother, Pat, would be healed with this whole revival and all of these signs that would happen to show Mike Bickle that he was going to have this great movement of God. Well, guess what? Pat passed away. So... Who was the person that Mike asked to change the prophetic history notes for that section? Me, because I was working as his transcriber and we had to follow a new audio story uh, when remaking the notes for the 10 year anniversary. So we went through and changed some of the things. I don't even remember all of it. At the time, I made excuses for it. Um, so, yeah. 
I would say that through changing the prophetic history, you are also systematically launched. And God was going to build this giant movement around the world when everybody sees that the brother was healed. Well, the brother died and was never healed. So they changed it to, wow, what a miracle that Bob Jones revealed the secret that Mike had made, uh, the secret vow that Mike had made to his dad. Now, maybe he did do that. It's really not that big of a secret, though. Why would he not tell his wife, hey, um, hey, honey, I just want you to know that I promised that I would take care of my brother because I really care for him because he got into this terrible accident and is, you know, never going to walk again. So I made a promise to my dad that I would take care of him. Why, why did he keep that a secret? Why would you keep that a secret to really anybody? It's, it's not something to be secretive about. But whatever the case, if Mike Bickle did make that secret to his dad, now he's telling a story about how Bob Jones revealed that to him. How do we know that story is true? We don't. We just have to trust that, that Mike Bickle is telling a true story. But Mike Bickle is now known to be a liar, at least by the women who had uh, ongoing affairs with him when they were underaged or um, when they were at least much, much younger than him. So... I don't think we should really be paying attention to this at all anymore. But I hope that by looking at the details of this, we can see how even when we don't know that somebody is a, a leading a double life or, you know, has the kind of the history that we now know about Mike Bickle, regardless, we don't need to put so much weight on somebody's so-called stories of so-called experiences with God or uh, apparent prophetic utterances that they received directly from God. What we have for sure is God's Word. What we have for sure is the simple truths that are laid out for us in God's Word that don't ever change, and we don't have any reason to doubt them. All he talked about was that it was a little bit less snow than, in fact, th they might have said it was. Or so Sam Storms here is really making it sound like my video was just trying to nitpick at nothing when, in fact, these prophecies were true. Well, I'm going to show you with detail some of the segments from my original video to prove my point. The only way people like Sam Storms can get away with this is if people just trust them. And he sounds confident. And it's that appearance of confidence that I really think causes most people who are inclined to believe him anyway to just say, well, yeah, obviously Stephen Kozar's video is wrong, so they won't even look at it. But if you look at it, you'll see that I'm not wrong, and I'm going to do that right now. Quote, the Lord says that on the first day of spring, when the snow melts, they will sit around the table and they will accept you. So later that night, Mike and Art are scheduled to go to another church in Kansas City. And the speaker there cancels. And so they had to cancel the meeting. So Art says, listen, he said, um, I was supposed to fly out tonight. He had a private plane. And he said, but it snowed. It was a late snow in, Mar in late March. He said, I I I'm grounded. I can't get out. So that was Sam Storms repeating what he heard from Mike Bickle about what was going on on March 20th of 1983. Here's the actual weather record. You can see that the temperature was hovering around 30 degrees. And after 6 p.m., it started to drop a bit. Again, where it dips down to zero, that's because there's no data for those hours. Now, the second graph down, the blue one, is precipitation. It's snow. If you look at the very left side of the chart, it looks like, oh, yeah, it's at the top of the chart. Well, that's five one-hundredths of an inch. And that incredibly tiny amount of snow ended at about 3 or 4 in the morning. But after that tiny amount of snow early in the morning... We're supposed to believe that Art Katz, 10, 12, 15 hours later, was snowed in. There's no way he could fly out, and that's why we had this miraculous meeting with Mike Bickle and Bob Jones. Let's look at the summary chart again from the National Weather Service. And if you look at March 20th, that's the one that is Sunday, the day when the plane was supposed to be grounded from all the snow. It says that there was 0.3 inches of snow. And if you added up the tiny amount of snow from the day before, you have a total of one inch of snow on the ground, possibly. Because the Weather Service actually tells their people to round up to the next nearest number. How do I know that? I looked it up from the Weather Service. Here's the instructions from the official government site telling people how they should round up. So knowing that, let's go back to this chart. And if you look near the bottom, the 21st is the day that I have underlined. That's the day when they had that miraculous meeting in the uh, early morning hours, one or two or three in the morning, depending on which story you listen to. And that's when Bob Jones said, look out the window, see the snow melting? 
You know, the snow that kept the airplane grounded? Look at how much snow was on the ground. It's, that, it's got the letter T. That stands for trace. What does trace mean? If less than a measurable amount is present on the ground, or if less than half of the ground is covered with snow, regardless of that snow's depth, this can be denoted by a trace. A trace is usually indicated by a capital letter T, or the word trace, in place of a numerical amount of accumulation. Here's a picture of a trace of snow that I just took off of Facebook because this happened in the Chicago area just a few days ago. This is what Bob Jones predicted as a double winter. This is what supposedly grounded an airplane from being able to take off. Let's read Mike Bickle's book from 1995, Growing in the Prophetic, and then let's compare this story to more recent versions of the same story. Art had intended to fly back on Sunday after the church service, but his small private plane was grounded due to bad weather. At about 9 p.m. that night, Art suddenly insisted on seeing Bob again. That's Bob Jones. We all gathered at my house from 10 p.m. until 3 a.m. It was an incredible evening. I was overwhelmed at some of the things God revealed to Bob about private issues and personal prayers in my life. I suddenly blurted out, Bob, I'm thankful that Art insisted on our meeting tonight. I really believe that you are truly prophetic. Bob smiled as he reminded me that he already knew we would accept him on the first day of spring and that he had prophesied this the first day we met. It was a true prophecy. The date was the 21st of March, the first day of spring. Our Art had been delayed by the sudden snow. We were all sitting around the table, and I had just accepted him with my own mouth. All of it happened just as Bob said the Lord told him it would. The unexpected snow on the 21st of March was predicted precisely by Bob to confirm the prophetic vision that God was raising up a prophetic church in Kansas City, and that Bob Jones would be used in its foundation. So what is the prediction concerning the snow? Well, it's that there would be snow on the first day of spring, the 21st of March. So they're sitting around the table. It's like one in the morning. And Bob says, what day is it? And Mike says, well, it's March 21st. He said, no, what day is it? He said, well, it's the first day of spring. Look out the window. What's happening? Mike looks out. The snow was melting. The snow had come that kept Art Katz from leaving, which the <laughs> Lord used to providentially orchestrate the get-together in the first place. God's providence is all over this. Mike said, yeah, the snow's melting. Don't you remember what I told you on the first day of spring when the snow melts, we'll sit around the table where they were and you will accept me as a prophet. Sam Storms was very specific as he retells the story that he got from Mike Bickle himself, that this was about the snow not only coming, but then melting exactly at the right time that would prove the prophecy was true, which goes against Mike Bickle's own book, where it was just about the snow coming. There's no mention of it melting. And even in this recent clip, Mike Bickle flips the story back to the old version where on the first day of spring, the snows are coming. Although most of the recent appearances that I've watched, he says that the snow was melting. And he said, no, he goes, the snows are coming again on the first of spring. Remember how I called my initial video, extraordinary claims, conflicting evidence. Well, this whole thing is just full of that. And there's basically three versions of this first day of spring snowstorm story. The first version is the one that's in Mike Bickle's book where he says it was miraculous that it snowed and the snow did this thing where it caused the people to get together. The second version of the story says, no, it's that the snow melted. And then the third version, which is I think the one that you would hear from Sam Storms, is that the snow came and then it melted. And he said, but it snowed. It was a late snow in, Mar in late March. He said, I I I'm grounded. I can't get out. Quote, the Lord says that on the first day of spring, when the snow melts, they will sit around the table and they will accept you. First day of spring, when the snow melts, Me meaning in 1983, in nine months, you're going to meet them. On the first day of spring, when the snow melts, they're going to accept you. He said, at the first day of spring, when the snow melts, they'll sit around the table and they will accept me. And the weather records show that there was no snow on that day. And the weather records also show that it could not have melted when they were all sitting around the table. It wasn't just below freezing when Bob Jones was supposed to have said, look out the window and see the snow melting. It was actually below 25 degrees. We have the hour by hour weather records for that entire day. We have everything. We have the wind. We have the snow or precipitation, we have the temperatures, and none of it lines up with the stories that have been told. Any version of the story, none of them fit. So even though I'm showing you all of this actual data right off the internet from these official weather sites, Sam Storms claims that he went to the library, he did the research, and you don't have to, you can just trust him because he's telling the truth. So I went to the Kansas City Library and I have got the newspaper articles 
And I can uh, actually did research with the National Weather Service to confirm all of that. Or there was a little bit less rain that, that was prophesied that actually came about. No, what, what I said was the stories that you tell, Sam Storms, the stories that you just verbatim copied from Mike Bickle are wildly inaccurate. Your storytelling does not line up with the weather records. Now, if when you tell a story that there was a tremendous downpour at 7 p.m., what you really mean is that there was a light rain at 8 a.m., then I guess we have two different versions of what reality actually is. So don't say something is verifiable and empirically verifiable if you can't verify it with empirical evidence. What, what, did, what was the prophecy? Well, Bob, the, Bob prophesied after a season of serious drought in Kansas City, which it was. It was the second driest summer in history. Well, in Mike Bickle's 1995 book, he said it was the third driest summer on record for Kansas City in approximately 100 years. It was the second driest summer in history. It was the second driest summer in history. Well, I found this really nifty chart from the Weather Service, and it shows 100 years of droughts for the state of Missouri. If you move your cursor over it, you can see the uh, darkest warm red-orange colors at the top. Those represent the driest years, and of course the bottom part represents the wettest times. Now, look at the year 1983. I've got a couple of black arrows there to help you see it. That's supposed to be the second worst or the third worst drought in 100 years? Now, this chart isn't exactly perfect just because it tries to show the entire year in a very small amount of space. But still, there is rain and there isn't a tremendous amount of heat and drought showing at the top. Here's a really interesting graph I found. Now, this is for the state of Kansas and Kansas City is in Missouri, but it's also in Kansas. And the church in 1983 that's being referred to was actually in Overland Park, and that's in Kansas. So in any event, there is no 1983 at all on this chart of the driest summers on record. It was the second driest summer in history. Then on August 23rd, it would rain to confirm the word that he had given. Okay, now I'm going to play for you part of the video that I did just a few months ago that goes into more detail, and you'll see how none of these prophetic stories line up with the weather records yet again. In fact, the stories don't even line up with each other. Let's take a look at how Mike Bickle told this same story when he wrote it down for his 1995 book, Growing in the Prophetic. Our church was scheduled to gather for a meeting the evening of August 23rd. Just before the church meeting began, there came a tremendous downpour of rain for almost an hour. And it only rained about 20, 30 minutes. I don't even know, but it was, I don't know how long it rained, maybe 15, 20, 25 minutes, but it rained so intense. There came a tremendous downpour of rain for almost an hour. August 23rd comes. I mean, we're thinking, we gather on that night, 7 o'clock, and I mean, the rain came fiercely. Our meeting was at 7 o'clock, and it rained, I don't know how long, but the 5 or 10 minutes till 7, and the 5 and 10 minutes after 7, it was so like torrential rain, you could not get, leave your car. Everybody stayed in their car till there was a reprieve, and they ran in. In that version of the story, Mike Bickle says it could have rained for as little as only 10 or 15 minutes. But he said something completely different when he was giving the prophetic history in 1986, as was recorded by Ernie Gruen in his paper. Mike Bickle told a different version of the story on tapes that he made in 1986. In that version of the story, Bob Jones gave a prophetic word at the end of May, saying that there was going to be a three-month drought, and at the end of that drought, on August 23rd, the drought would end with a rainstorm. And he says originally in those tapes from 1986 that there was a tremendous downpour and there was three to four inches of rain. That's what he originally told everybody. The, the rain was so intense you could not walk through it. And the Lord gave his excla ex ex exclamation point. The rain came on August 23rd. It was like a torrential downpour. We were so excited, and Bob was there. He said, I told you, the rain would come on this day. And he goes, but that's not the message. The message is there is an appointed hour when the rain is coming to this nation, the spiritual rain. It's as sovereignly ordained as that August 23rd was. Now here, look at paragraph D at the bottom. This is important that I say this. Here you will see Mike Bickle giving a really poor excuse for why he said it was three to four inches. And you will see that he's really grasping at straws, trying to make it sound like he corrects for errors when what he's really doing is just covering his tracks. That in 1986, right afterwards, three years afterward, I was, we were right here in the building telling the story. 
And I talked to a bunch of guys afterwards because the torrent, it was a torrential rain for the minutes before and after. And then at the end of the meeting, we're celebrating, screaming, hollering through the meeting. At the end of the meeting, it's pouring down rain again. And what I, we don't know is it's not raining the whole two to three hours during the meeting. We're assuming it is. So I get some guys. I'm going to tell the first prophetic history. And I go, I get some guys together. I go, now, how much did it rain? I mean, no, we wasn't like checking the weather. They didn't have Google back then. And, you know, a couple of people said, I don't know, a couple of inches for sure. And I said, does anybody know? Nobody does. So I tell the story. It rained three or four inches. Because that's kind of, because it's at the beginning, at the end. But we're screaming and hollering all in the meeting. And we don't know it stopped raining. So we find out later that it didn't rain that much. And so I corrected that publicly. The reason why he had to admit to this huge mistake was because of Ernie Gruen's paper, not because they decided that they were going to try to be accurate with what was being told. On top of that, he's ignoring how Bob Jones's original prophecy said that the drought would begin in June and that that drought would end with this spectacular supernatural rainstorm on August 23rd. The more recent version of the story says, no, the drought didn't begin until July and it kept going after August 23rd. And so I just wanted to say that, that I did declare it one time, because just in the enthusiasm of it, because I talked to some folks, I went to our leaders afterwards, like some year, a couple years later, I go, let's, let's actually do some heavy fact checking, find out all the dates and everything. And since that time, I recorrected that. I just felt like it's important. If you say something wrong, you need to correct it. Okay, so now we're going to August 23rd, 1983, and you can see there's a point one eight tenths of an inch of rain at about seven or eight in the morning. There's no rain at all the rest of the day. You know, the day with the torrential downpour at 7 p.m. and then another torrential downpour a few hours later. It rained so hard that people couldn't even walk through the rain. I don't even know how that's possible. I've never heard of rain stopping people from being able to walk. The only time there was rain, you can see right there, two tenths of an inch was at 8 a.m. in the morning, not at 7 p.m. at night or at 6 p.m., as Mike Bickle originally told in 1986. Oh, here's one more chart that I found. This is observed weather in 1983 in Kansas City. It goes all the way through the year, and it shows various forms of precipitation. And if you look at the top part, that's what happens in the evenings of each of these days. And in the evenings of August, there is no rain at all especially the second half of the month of August. Here's another part of the drought story that's really important to bring up. I keep using this page from Mike Bickle's book, but that middle section there, that one sentence, the drought continued the next day and lasted another five weeks, three months in all, as prophesied, with the exception of August 23rd. Now remember, Bob Jones prophesied at the end of May that there would be no more rain until August 23rd. They changed that to say, well, there would be rain, but eventually there's going to be a three-month drought, and on August 23rd there will be a reprieve, followed by five weeks of drought. And this simple little weather chart that shows the daily precipitation in 1983 in Kansas City shows that neither one of those stories can be true. They're both wrong. Badly distorting the truth of the matter. Because I, I know the stories very, very much in detail have been empirically verified. Here's a portion of my video that Sam Storm said was supposed to be badly distorting the truth of the matter. And this is about the lack of a three-month drought, according to the weather records. First of all, let's look at the precipitation totals for Kansas City for the entire year. Now, he made this prediction at the end of May that there was going to be a three-month drought. Well, if we look at the month of May, that there was plenty of rain in May. And there was also plenty of rain in June. July was absolutely terrible. Barely any rain at all. August wasn't much better, but September had almost two inches of rain. Now remember that Mike Bickle said there was a big downpour on August 23rd, which was actually just a shower. But he said after that there was five weeks of drought. Let's look at the records and see if that's true. Let's go into just a little bit of detail. The month of May was actually a very good month for rain. It was above average. So they had a little bit of a surplus of rain in May. And then in June, they had plenty of rain right up to the last week of June. Mike Bickle said that the drought started at the end of June, but that's not quite correct. If you're going to be totally fair and honest, you'd have to say that the actual drought began after the 4th of July. And it was a bad drought for that time period. Now here's the month of August again, and I've got the uh, date of the 23rd circled, but there were a couple of other days in the following week where it did rain, but very little rain, but it still was a little bit of rain. But Mike Bickle said that after August 23rd, 
There was five weeks of no rain, that the drought continued for five weeks. That means there should be no rain at the end of August, and there should be no rain at all for the entire month of September. But here is the month of September, and it was not a great month for rain, but it wasn't a month of total drought either. It was roughly half the normal amount of rain for September. So again, he was exaggerating quite a bit when he said that the drought continued for another five weeks. So in the most recent version of this story in the magical world of Mike Bickle, they had a meeting at 7 p.m. and there was a torrential downpour at the very moment they entered the building. It went away almost immediately. And then as soon as they started to exit the building, two or three hours later, no one knows for sure, there was another torrential downpour that just happened to be going on at the time they were leaving. And he just mistakenly thought it had been raining the whole time. And yet the weather records indicate there was no rain at all. And Sam Storms made it his job to listen to all of these stories from Mike Bickle and to repeat them and to scold anybody who didn't believe them. August 23rd came and it rained. So... For Stephen Kozar to say it didn't, it did rain on the church in that location. We but, all know that that happens. Mike, okay, but Mike Bickle said that there was, he had this dramatic story of everyone cheering but because it came a downpour, a downpour at 7 p.m., a mm -hmm. heavy downpour. For at a 7, very short time. Have, you, ever, have that, you not ever had that happen? And the, the actual total amount of rainfall is maybe a quarter of an inch? That. There are hundreds of people, Justin, who were there, H not just Mike, hundreds of people who were present who got drenched. So are we going to say they all lied? Well, weather records, it did not. There was not a downpour at 7 p.m. There was a... Not in the totality of Kansas City, but in that particular area, this happens all the time, where one area 500 yards away can have a downpour of rain and you don't get a single drop where you're standing. That happens. And especially if it was God's supernatural provision, it could easily happen. So now we don't have any records of this downpour, but hey, it certainly could happen, especially with it being the supernatural provision of God. So instead of saying this is a empirically verifiable event, he's now saying, well, this was a supernatural event. So you just have to trust us. Remember when Sam said this? Okay, so I went to the Kansas City Library and I have got the newspaper articles and I can actually did research with the National Weather Service to confirm all of that. In conclusion, I'm going to play the clip that ended this video, but I want to say that if there actually was a very brief but strong downpour of rain on August 23rd at 7 p.m., but it just was so isolated that it wasn't recorded by the weather services, I can accept that. So if a bunch of eyewitnesses come forward and say they were there and they're sure that it happened and it wasn't, you know, three hours and it wasn't three to five inches and all that, and they actually make what appear to be legitimate claims, that would be the actual empirical evidence that Sam Storms never provided. That wouldn't change the fact that a lot of the details that we've heard from Mike Bickle and then from Sam Storms have been greatly exaggerated and at times have been outright falsehoods. Now I want to end this video with the same ending that I used for the original video I made just about a year ago. Thanks so much for watching. Mike Bickle makes a big deal out of how skeptical he was and this makes it easier to trust his stories because it appears that he was convinced by factual events. We are tempted to just believe everything he and Sam Storm says as a result. Instead of blindly trusting these stories, I want to make a few points. Number one, if it was okay for Mike Bickle to be skeptical, then he shouldn't be too upset when we're skeptical too. Show us the weather reports, Mike. Most importantly, regardless of the uh, specifics of some of these predictions, none of these stories point us back to Christ and Him crucified for our sins. These are at best a big distraction from true biblical faith.